In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. I'm Pastor Peter Kurowski from Zion Lutheran Church in Canastota and St. John Lutheran Church in Montrose, South Dakota. And again, I'm honored to bring to you the Word of God on this sixth Sunday of uh, Rogate Easter, and uh, in particular, a little bit of a Bible study on a key phrase that comes out of our second reading for today from 1 Peter chapter 3, 13 through 22. Often in the church, maybe every other Sunday, uh, we confess that Jesus descended into hell. A lot of people are confused about what that phrase means. Some of the more liberal churches in um, Christendom have taken that phrase out of the Apostles' Creed. I believe that is a mistake because it is a very biblical phrase and it is something that is very important for us to consider from a number of facets. When we confess that Jesus descended into hell, we are confessing how Jesus' body and spirit was made alive by the Spirit and descended into hell in fulfillment of his very first gospel promise given to Adam and Eve in the garden that he would come and crush the head of the fallen angel, the devil. Jesus goes into his backyard and he goes into the devil's backyard, namely hell, as cosmic ruler over all things. As Luther would say, Sabaoth Lord, Lord of the angel armies, to proclaim victory not only of death, but over sin and over the devil. Here's what Peter writes in his Epistle of Hope. He writes, Now, who there is no harm, no harm if you suffer for good, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your heart confess, and here he says, Jesus as Lord, ruler over all things as holy, and always be prepared to give a defense if anyone asks of you the hope that you have within. Defense here, the word is apologia, apology, defense, who ask you for the reason for the hope that you have in you. And again, hope is faith toward the future based on what Jesus has perfectly done in the past in terms of keeping all those mighty promises in the Old Testament that he gave to the prophets and to Moses and to many others and has perfectly fulfilled them based on his perfect record. We have faith toward the future. That is real, true, powerful, prophetic, biblical hope. But when we are asked to share the hope that we have through this risen Savior, Peter writes, we are to do it with gentleness and respect, so that when you are slandered, you have a good conscience, and those that revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Now here's the rich gospel that comes forth. For Christ, Messiah, suffered once for our sins, once for all. Jesus, the righteous, died for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, the sweet swap. Jesus, the righteous, gets our unrighteousness, suffers in our place, we receive in baptism his righteousness. Peter's going to make that very clear here. What happens? He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, or by the Spirit. I think the King James capitalizes that for the Holy Spirit. Listen carefully to the language. Jesus was put to death in the flesh. When did that happen? On Good Friday. His body was put into the earth, into the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, in fulfillment of Isaiah 53, from virgin womb to virgin tomb. So Jesus' body is put into the grave. His spirit goes to heaven. He said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. So, what is it that must be made alive? His body must be made alive when he quickens it. And that body comes to life on Easter, on the day of resurrection. So, watch the language again very carefully here. Christ suffered for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, God the Father, he was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And now watch this. 
and he went, he actually went, the language was real clear, and he proclaimed the spirits in prison. So his body made alive as risen Lord. The first place he goes is into the devil's backyard and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Prison here, the Greek word, philake, in Revelation is defined as the home of the devil. So Jesus, made alive, goes right into the home of the devil and he preaches to spirits in prison, home of the devil, namely hell. Now who are these spirits that Jesus has risen Lord proclaims victory over? Peter tells us in the next verse. They were those who formerly did not believe and obey when God's patience, namely 120 years, waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. So these were the people back in Noah's day, the spirits in prison, whose bodies were in the earth yet, but their spirit went to hell. And this was the epitome of a group of people. God had been very forbearing through a great preacher of righteousness, Noah, and none of them came to faith. They scorned the gospel. They scorned the gift of forgiveness. They scorned God's unconditional love. And it was a generation that Moses records in Genesis 6 that they had evil thoughts of abominable uh, nature with everything they thought of. It was just deeply depraved. It's the epitome of unbelief. To these spirits, back in Noah's day, Jesus descends into hell to proclaim victory. Now, something else here. Uh, how large the gathering is, we can only uh, vaguely speculate. But remember, people lived to be 600, 700, 800, 900 years old. And so this was a very large gathering to whom Jesus proclaimed victory over the grave too. It wasn't to give them an evangelical altar call. The word preached here is not the Greek word in the New Testament for preach the gospel. That's oion galleon, preach the good news. Peter does not use that word here, but simply the word that he preached if it was good news to them, it was too late because they had rejected it. The whole tenor of the verse is that this was the very wicked generation of Noah, uh, the very savage generation of Noah, and Christ was proclaiming victory because he had promised to Adam and Eve in the garden that he would crush the head of the serpent. And how does he do this? He rises bodily from the dead and proclaims right in hell, victory over death, the devil, and sin. The Bible goes on a little bit farther as Christ proclaims his great victory over death, the devil, and sin. He says, baptism, which corresponds to how God saved with water in the Old Testament, now saves you. Very clear. Baptism now saves you. Not by removal of dirt from our body, but by promising a good conscience, a clear conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus the Messiah. So, through the resurrection of Jesus the Messiah, uh, God saves us. So it's Jesus through baptism who saves us, and it's Jesus through baptism who gives us his perfect record. That's why we have a clean conscience before God. Jesus not only washes away our sin, but he gives us his righteousness. And so before God, we stand there with a perfect record through the power of holy baptism, a twofold thing there of forgiveness and righteousness that comes to us. So through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, through baptism, Jesus saves. And now the last verse here. Jesus, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, which is everywhere, because God is everywhere, and to be at the right hand of everywhere is to be everywhere, in power, it's a phrase from the Old Testament. So Jesus is ruling, reigning in power at the right hand of God and is everywhere. And watch this phrase, with angels, authorities, and powers that have been subjected unto him. When you look at this wonderful phrase in the Old Testament of Sabbath Lord, ruler of all the angel armies, God is the ruler of all the angel armies. It's applied to Jesus and the Father. 
And when Jesus descended into hell in victory, body and spirit, to proclaim victory over the devil, over death, over sin, here we see him operating as Sabbath Lord, and there is none other God, as Luther rightly says, in a mighty fortress. Ruler over all things. You see it in Revelation chapter 5, you see it here, you see it in Psalm 46 in the Old Testament. The Sabbath Lord is the Jacob wrestling God, Jesus who wrestled with him. All of that is there. And so on Sunday mornings when we confess that Jesus descended into hell, that is a step and state of exaltation, of Easter, first resurrection, victory over the grave, of how that power is in baptism and how Jesus is Sabbath Lord. And that's why it's an exciting thing to confess in the Apostles' Creed. May that good news on Rogate Sunday give you great joy. The Lord Jesus be with you.